Well, uh, I'm a little bit taller, but is this okay? Okay, awesome. So interestingly enough, between the two of us, people would probably say that Heidi is the more emotionally stable one. <laughs> so I am very convicted. When the God calls me to do something, I will go. Even if it means that I'm going to go crying the whole way there, the whole time I'm there, and the entire way back. But I don't think I cried until our second month there. That was amazing. I just had so much peace. And maybe it was because God knew that we couldn't handle two of us struggling at the same time. Might have been a bit much. But uh, yeah, so it was just really, really interesting to have so much confidence. Um, the third day that I was there volunteering, uh, uh, my Spanish-speaking vo other volunteers, who I couldn't really communicate with, uh, forgot about me. <laughs> and uh, I went to my there, and I'm like, nobody's here. The sisters are praying. They're putting the girls down to bed. Um, I have to figure out how to get back to the mother house, and I have no idea how to do that. So uh, we're supposed to take an auto rickshaw, and we're supposed to say manictola, but at that time I couldn't say the word, so I just walked, and I kept walking, and I kept walking, and I'm like, and I had... I had peace. I was lost in the middle of Calcutta with thousands of people where people are always warning me about gang rape and all these things. And I'm like, wow, in the complete, utter chaos and poverty, have I never experienced such deep, profound peace in my life. But I did make it home. I eventually got found a taxi. And pretty much everyone knows if you say mother house and you're white and you're kind of in that area, they're like, oh, you're probably a volunteer. So we can get you there, and then they just overcharge you because I don't know how much rupees I'm supposed to pay for a taxi. <laughs> so, um, But anyway, Heidi had mentioned that we had had Mass every morning, and one of the things they do when they pray is they pray a psalm, and they'll separate the psalm into stanzas, and then they'll take a line from the psalm, and then they'll have the congregation repeat that line so you can pray and read the psalm together. So I wrote a psalm, I guess you could call it, based off that, and it's called my Calcutta Psalm. Um, Jacob, could you please bring up my first slide, or Carson? I thought it was Jacob back there. I got surprised. Oh, they're both there. <laughs> okay, so it's just a simple response. So I will simply say, come Lord Jesus, and you say, so come Lord Jesus. Okay, so every time I say that, you'll respond. So this is my Calcutta song, psalm. And it's called The Work of Our Hands. To do laundry by hand is very therapeutic, and it's whimsical as the sun kisses your cheek. You could belt out in song, but then you take in a breath and you realize the repulsive stench of man's misery. This isn't Cinderella. This is Calcutta, India. And it's not me playing house when I still have a safe bed to fall asleep or no doubts about where my next meal is coming from. And we grunt about our food touching when they eat from trash. Come, Lord Jesus. Our beds are a haven, and they sleep alongside the busy street, a bed made of trash, stone, and dirt, exposed to the elements and the rats. But yet, sleep is still a small escape from their suffering. Come, Lord Jesus. Sleep, babe, sleep. Dear sorrows of humanity, I cradle thee. Please sleep but too soon to awaken once again to the reality of poverty. An endless cycle, minutes, hours, days, weeks, and years. And we cannot spare them all from their agony. I and you alone cannot fight, as Paul says in Colossians, man's idolatry, which is greed. But we can love one, maybe relieve one thorn from the poor man's side, and we must groan with all of creation, saying, Come, Lord Jesus. No one should live this way. See the work of their hands. No time for rest. No time for play. For there is too much laundry to do, and the woman goes to the side of the busy street to wash her clothes from a drain. A young boy washes his dishes from the drain of a public bath. Come, Lord Jesus. Sunrise to sunset, hands are busy for just their daily bread, if even that. See, dear Jesus, these poor hands, the hours of hard work in these sickening conditions. It's the gift that I bring to the altar. I bring it to the altar when they can't. They don't even know your name. They have never heard of you, and they don't know who you are. I can't possibly tell them all. 
So I lay them at the altar, and I cry out for mercy. Yet in the very depths of their soul, they wail and they mourn for you. For Lord, did you not make them? Did you not make them for yourself alone? Have mercy on us. Hear humanity's cry of past, present, and future. Have mercy on us. Come, Lord Jesus. O oh Lord, bless the work of our hands, of their hands, and give them rest in you, as you promised. The poor, give them the kingdom of heaven, as you promised. O oh, let them at last find eternal rest. Bless the work of their hands. And even though my soft, lazy hands compared to theirs, please, O oh Lord, Bless the work of my hands, too, and all of my intentions. Grant me rest in you. Come, Lord Jesus. Being overwhelmed by the poverty of just so many people and so many situations can really, can, it can either draw you into despair, but you can, it can draw you into remember how broken we are and how desperately we need God to come back. I remember talking to Heidi, and she had said once, you know, Jesus has come, so we have that hope. But yet, we're waiting for him to come again. So there's a sense of exile as we're waiting for Jesus' second coming to totally go into the fulfillment of everything that he's calling us to. Now, if uh, Jacob or Carson would please pull up my next slide. I'm going to introduce you to three people. The first one is Gianna. Gianna is a 14-year-old girl with epilepsy. And if I told you that she gets up at 6 a.m. to pray with the sisters every morning by her own choice, her and another girl, would you believe me? She's not a very good pitter, pitcher. Rita sent it to me. She's the one in the middle. Um, anyway, she's a beautiful smile. But she gets up because she desires to receive Jesus in communion, and she desires to pray for the, po for the world. And this is a 14-year-old girl. And when I, one day I was feeding her. She can't feed herself. Her, her hands are fixed in this position. Um, and it, she's a good eater. I could feed her quick and feed her fast. And it was very efficient and tidy and clean. But then I realized her fingers were moving. I could place the spoon in her hand. I could hold her hand, and her hand could hold the spoon, and she could feed herself. But that meant it was going to be slower, it was going to be longer, and it was going to be a whole lot messier. But I was realizing that this is my relationship with God. I want it to be quick, efficient, and tidy, but God isn't interested in efficiency. He's interested in relationship and what's beneficial for me. And, this, and me being involved in my healing is not me gaining my way to heaven. It's because God wants a bond with me. I want him to fix it like that because I don't want to deal with the messiness that it takes to be healed. I don't want to learn humility. Can't he just give it to me? But unlike Gianna, who's eager to be messy, I'm not quite as eager. So I'm praying for that grace, I'm just learning to be humble and abandon myself to God, whatever that looks like. The second person is Rita. You can switch to the next picture. But she's actually in this picture too. But Rita is a 26-year-old girl who never wants to get married, which is pretty difficult when you're in India. In Canada, it's not too bad. too bad. She devotes herself completely to the service of her siblings. She goes to Diadan, where I was volunteering, in the mornings, sometimes in the afternoons, five days a week to work with children with disabilities. And then she also works with slum kids. Plus, she sometimes starts working at 6 a.m. in the morning to give people facials and haircuts and wax to have an income, which she pays her bills and then pretty much gives all of it away, whether that's buying for saris for people on the street or making them food. And I remember Sister Joy coming up to me, and I said, wow, Rita's just so inspiring. And Sister Joy says, you know what? She doesn't even know Jesus. But she might be Hindu, but she's a saint because she gets it. She gives of herself completely, and she gives the freedom. And all I could think about was when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, and I think it's Matthew 25. I don't have my thing up here, but anyway, something like that. And, there, and they ask him, he says, you know, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And the people respond, when, Lord? When did we do this? And I don't know exactly in what context they were responding, but I could see Rita being like, I don't even know who you are. 
And when did I serve you? And he's like, you did. Every time you served the least of these, you served me. Because if Jesus walked in here today, I don't know if I would recognize him. And I know Rita wouldn't, but I know Rita would go and serve him without a shadow of a doubt because she serves everybody. Even the way she touched you was so affectionate and self-giving. So if I could abandon myself to the relationship of being healed in the process of being messy, like Gianna, and if I could give of myself to people so selflessly like Rita, that was something I needed to know. But my last friend, I don't have a picture of her. I don't even know her name. We were talking a lot, or Pastor Jeff was talking about names last week. And names are important in our identity. And this, this woman was in a bed dying of cancer. Um, she was in Myanmar, but most people know it around the world as the house of the dying. We had the opportunity to volunteer some afternoons there. And the sister asked me to feed her one day. I didn't even notice her. She was the darkest skinned woman out of all that were there when I first met her, at least, because there's a lot of people that come in and out, out of that uh, home. And that's a very shameful thing in India. And I, as I rubbed lotion on her body, my one hand pretty much circled around her thigh. But then the last day, December 2nd, our last day of being there to volunteer, she was moved to a bigger bed. I went and I sat with her and I held her hand and I thought, what can I say and what can I do? She's teaching me more than I could ever say to her. I don't even, she doesn't even speak the same language as me. Maybe she doesn't even want me to hold her hand. But there's this simple prayer that my mom and my family has prayed for years. And I just held her hand and I prayed and it goes like this. Eternal Father, I offer you the body, the blood, the soul and divinity of your dearly beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of your sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. And you could just repeat that over and over again. For the sake of your sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. When I saw her, I saw Christ crucified, but I also saw all of humanity. And I saw the bride of Christ, and she had nothing but herself. And that's all God wants. God doesn't want our, our status or our commissions. That's why we go through a journey of healing because he's detaching us from the things that we cling and take our identity in when our identity is found in God. And she was poor and broken, but he was crazy in love with her and he wanted her so deeply. And then an Indian woman worker came to me and she said, can you help me feed? So I went to feed some of the other women, but as soon as I was done, I ran quickly to my friend she was gone, and she passed away. And I was like, wow. And I just fell, fell to her knees. There's something holy. I know there's a lot of people who have experienced death more often. I don't have a lot of experience in that in my life. But falling to the knees at someone who's passed on to life that is more alive than we are, it was holy, saying, God, help me just want you and you alone. And then I went home to the sisters, um, and we were praying that night in adoration. And the sisters looked at Jesus, and they just loved him with this confidence, but not a certainty of what they needed to do or how, figuring God out, but a simple of, God, I choose you, even though I don't understand, and I know that I desire you, so please strip me of these things that are keeping me from you. And they sang this very simple piece, and it just went, shepherd me, O God, from all my wants, from all my fears, from death into life. I didn't get any huge ta-da moments in Calcutta, like I received my calling and my vocation, and that, you know, maybe I had hoped for that, because I'm always looking for some sort of direction, and I'm, sometimes I'm getting tired of all these little temporary things that God is calling me to, but God is working in that, because God's will for me is to love him and to love my neighbor. And how can I discern through the opportunities that he gives me and just trust that I'm in his will, abandon myself like Gianna, love generously like Rita, and detach myself from the things of the world as my friend was. So the one thing that I wanted to say that I really felt uh, that spoke out to me as I looked at the sisters 
praying for God to detach them, is this verse from Song of Songs, and it was like I was saying it about the sisters and about Jesus the bridegroom. So it's Song of Songs 1, verses 2 to 4. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is perfume poured out. Therefore, the maidens, or the sisters, love you. Draw me after you. Let us make haste. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exalt and rejoice in you. We will exalt in your love, which is better than wine. And rightly do they love you. It's like I've experienced a touch of God. And in some ways, I know he hasn't abandoned me, but it felt like he has. But it's only because so I can strive after him. And as I go on, be stripped of these things that are keeping me from my heart from, pure, from purely loving him. There's a reason that it's the pure of heart that will see the face of God. Because our hearts are divided. We're forgiven of our sin, but healing takes time. And it usually takes a lifetime. So I don't have a lot of answers, but I am going to sing this little song if Karen would come up. I lost my original piano player today, but Karen is amazing, so she's going to play. Um, and it's just, it's just simple. I don't, I don't know, but I know that I love God, and I'm drawn to him. Nothing to cling to by your sweet hand. No clear emotions keeping me safe at night. Only your presence like a candlelight. After everything I've had, after everything I've lost, Lord, I know this much is true. I'm still drawn to Like a precious oil. Oh, I kiss your feet, Lord, with a holy joy. My tears an offering of my highest praise. Your eyes say welcome, and I receive your gifts. Cause after everything I've had, and after everything I've lost, Lord, I know this much is true. I'm still drunk. After everything's been said, and after everything love cost, Lord, I know this much is true. I'm still.